One of the great privileges of working at History Hit and making films together with our team at Timeline is the access we get to extraordinary historical locations like this one, Stonehenge. I'm right in the middle of the stone circle now. It is an absolutely extraordinary place to visit. If you want to watch the documentary like the one we're producing here, go to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix for history. And if you use the code TIMELINE when you check out, you'll get a special introductory offer. See you there. Go on, Fecky Yankee, ready for departure. I am rolling in here. In the past few years, I've been seeing the world a little differently. Beautiful. I'm Arthur Williams. I used to be a Royal Marine. But ever since I was a small boy, I'd always dreamt of flying. Eight years ago, I got my pilot's license. And then came this little beauty, my Piper Cub. It's just an absolute joy to fly. I love this aeroplane. So this summer, I'm off on an aerial adventure. Sprint boasts over 900 airfields, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. I'll discover island runways oh, wow. and fly planes that won the Battle of Britain. But beyond the aircraft, there's a world of espionage. That is the most claustrophobic space. And pioneering daredevils. I don't like it. Yeah, too late now, matey. I want to make the landings. Nail that sucker. Find the planes and meet the people who share my love of flying. I'm lucky enough to hold one of the 50,000 pilot's licenses issued in the UK. And from enthusiasts to fanatics and the odd British eccentric, the vast majority of us fly purely for fun. In a plane, there's few places you can't explore. But for my first adventure, I'm in part of the country where the airfields and aviators are steeped in tradition and full of surprises. In Somerset, I'm setting my sights on some gobsmacking jet technology. You kind of think it's a bit mad, but it works. Then it's north to find a very precise Cotswold craft and some serious aviation recycling. It's a good payday when you get rid of them. <laughs> Finally, I'll explore the secretive military lands of Wiltshire and a little known airfield with a very big history. But my first goal is a tiny airfield that thousands of pilots beat a path to. And it's brought me to the skies above Dorset. So this area here is Cranbourne Chase. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty. You can see why it's stunning. Especially on a day like today, it looks really, really lovely. Cranbourne Chase is a gigantic chalk plateau straddling the counties of Dorset, Wiltshire, Hampshire and Somerset. This stunning landscape is littered with grand country houses. Beautiful place to live, it looks immaculate from the air. All right, we'll serve it. He says with an aeroplane. <laughs> but I'm heading for somewhere that in my book is even grander. Perched on the very edge of Cranbourne Chase's Chalk Hills is the most beautiful landing spot in southwest England, Compton Abbas. When I first got my pilot's licence, what, eight years ago, Compton Abbas was one of the first airfields I wanted to go and visit. If you think of airfields as drab, soulless places filled with concrete, think again. Lush green grass forms the runway here, backed by stunning views across the Dorset countryside. But these panoramas can have a sting in their tail. 
be careful, quite a tricky landing here because she's perched on top of the hill at 800 feet and you get winds that roll over the top and there's the trees. So we'll have to be on our guard today. For a plane as light as mine, anything more than a 15 mile an hour crosswind on landing can spell trouble. Right, let's get that wing down. It's not unknown for pilots to need more than one go at a landing here. Not my tidiest effort, but I'm down. As I park up, it gives me a chance to introduce you properly to my pride and joy. Well, this is my Piper Cub. This is Golf Bravo Delta Echo Yankee. It's a J3 Piper Cub. It was built in 1943 for the American military during the Second World War. Got brought over to the UK in the 1970s, where it's had, I think, three owners, of which I'm the third. And uh, here she is today. I love it. It's amazing. My wife, Rebecca, refers to herself as an aviation widow. She's my wife, but this is my mistress. <laughs> But this Piper Cub is more than just an aeroplane to me. Ten years ago, I was seriously injured in a car crash. And today this aircraft allows me to get around in a way I could never have imagined. This aircraft's been modified for myself because obviously I can't use my legs. Uh, normally we use our legs to control the rudder pedals, but I have to use my left hand. And uh, I took about 18 months to put a control in here so I move it forward for right rudder and back for left. It's pretty simple, really. With the cub parked up, it's time to check this place out because there's something rather special happening at Compton Abbas today, a flying. A fly-in is a set date in the calendar when people and their planes descend on an airfield from far and wide. 180 of these events happen across the UK every year. This is where pilots can show off their own plane and admire plenty of others. A leopard moth, it was built by de Havilland, beautiful aeroplane. From the 1940s, there's a Boeing Stearman, and from the 21st century, a couple of high-tech gyrocopters. Unusual looking machine, of course, made famous by James Bond when he shot down all of the black helicopters single-handedly. I think as close as you'll ever get to a flying bug. At certain times, Compton's flying can see more takeoffs and landings than Heathrow. See my Piper Cub behind this beautiful Harvard here, the big machine. During the Second World War, the American pilots would have learnt on the Piper Cub and then they'd have progressed to something more complex and heavier like the Harvard. One of the most impressive planes to fly in is this Stinson Reliant. Instantly recognisable by its gull-shaped wings, which help give the pilot increased visibility. One of just 1,300 that rolled off the production line, this beautifully restored 1942 aircraft was owned by one General Curtis LeMay, the US Air Force Chief of Staff under President Kennedy. Now it's the pride and joy of a Brit, Gordon Williamson, who's been a regular at this flying for over a decade. What sort of performance do you get from it then? What's your cruise at? Well, it's 300 horsepower radial, yeah. so we cruise at about 100. It's a little more luxurious than the Cub, I have to say. Yeah, it's lots of leather, it's a bit like a Cadillac, really. Lots of brass fittings. Fit for a general. Indeed, exactly. <laughs> Despite his lofty military status, Curtis LeMay insisted on keeping his hand in when it came to flying. The general was at his beck and call and used for regular family holidays. It would have had a small army of people keeping it in the air. Today, it's just Gordon polishing the leather and shining the chrome. General LeMay, I'm sure, never got his hands oily. I love that. Okay. Goes down to the lake for the weekend, comes back on the Sunday. They are hanger boys. I'm off back to my mansion. I reckon that's pretty much how it was. <laughs> 
The Compton Abbas fly-in has been a fixture in the aviation calendar for over 25 years. And one man has made it what it is. In the 1980s, Clive Hughes lived in London and worked for British Airways. But then, some friends told him there was an airfield for sale in Dorset. Last year, he welcomed 120,000 guests. It's pretty 24-7 really, uh, but it's a family-run concern. My wife Margaret and uh, Laura, they run the catering side. And Emma, my oldest daughter, and myself, we deal with the operational side, the flying training. Thanks to the Hughes family, this small patch of the southwest now has fans right across the world. I've been to a bar in Australia and the guy, he said, where are you from, mate? So I said, southern England. It's an airfield, actually, near Shatter. He said, is that Compton Abbas? <laughs> this has also happened in South Africa and in the States. So It's a well-known strip. Quite, yeah. Could you ever see yourself moving from here? No, I couldn't, actually. Uh, everything that I want is here. Never get fed up with that view. By late afternoon, most pilots are heading home. And as the sky is clear, there's enough room for a completely different sort of aircraft. This is 30-year-old Lauren Richardson, and she's brought along a Kristen Eagle II. Built with three things in mind, speed, power, and aerobatics. So this is one of your beasts then, eh? Yeah. Big, big engine up front, it's over 200 horsepower. It will do over 200 miles an hour in a dive quite happily. And there's one very specific feature of this aerobatic plane. It's made for two. Don't grab whiskey, uh, lining up. The Kristen Eagle can climb over 2,000 feet a minute, more than twice as fast as my Cub. Oh my good Lord. And I can certainly feel it. Oh, Lauren. Lauren was the 2012 British female aerobatic champion, so I'm in pretty safe hands. What sort of height do you need to be able to do aerobatics safely? Normal kind of aerobatics, around about 2,500, 3,000 feet. So yeah, we are plenty high enough, so we'll just do a quick basic sequence. This aeroplane is powerful enough to pull straight into a manoeuvre, so if you're ready, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. away we go. Away you go. So, pulling about 4G. All the way up. Look over the head to the horizon. Wow. We had a little flick roll, so the whole world will go around like we're in a washing machine. <laughs> there we go, back down the other side, big pull at the bottom. So Lawrence, what was it about aerobatics that particularly got you excited? just the freedom of it really. I was a uh, mountaineer before I really got into flying and oh, really? then I was getting a bit dangerous so uh, aerobatic flying uh, <laughs> it was a safer, more sane option. To most people that sounds truly mental. Yeah, but it made sense at the time and I, I stand by it, I stand by it. I'll tell you what, I'll show you a competition four point roll. Yeah, yeah. Everything about this aircraft is super strong. The wings are lashed with steel cables and the fuselage is reinforced. Pulling these sorts of manoeuvres, my cub would break into pieces. I'm going to get out of this and start crying though, you know. <laughs> I'm only laughing because it's even that hard I cry. But Lauren has saved the best, or should I say worst, till last. We'll do one last thing and then we'll head back in. I'm, I'm yeah. going to show you a spin. Because we're high and we need to lose some height. A spin sees an aircraft corkscrew towards the ground in the most death-defying of manoeuvres. Getting into one is easy. All Lauren needs to do is cut the engine. So we'll throttle him back. 
and let gravity take over. Wow. So here we go. The aeroplane is auto rotating. We're going down, 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 down. The aircraft is out of control now. Completely in control, as you have just seen. Wow. To get out of a spin, the pilot must kick the rudder in the opposite direction to the spin, stop the wings rotating, and then pull up before things get messy. And there we are. <laughs> the spinning manoeuvre is something that killed many pilots in the early days. Yeah, 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 I did. But now, now we understand it. That was one of the most thrilling experiences of my life. <laughs> How was that? Oh my god. <laughs> that was so fun. So like, I'm used to it, but it's um it's I'm trying to remember what that's like for the first time. <laughs> Sunshine. Great planes and great company. What an awesome start to my flying adventure. The southwest of England. It's not a bad place to be when you're a thousand feet up and the sun is shining. Oh, wow. Oh, how amazing. Just down under my wingtip here. I've got the village of Cern Abbott, it's carved out of the hillside, it's the man with the club. He's got a massive erection and a big club. <laughs> that looks amazing. What a privilege to see him from the air. It's said that postcards of the Cern Abbott giant are the only indecent photographs that the Royal Mail will happily accept. I'm leaving Dorset and heading to the rather flatter lands of Somerset. This area is stacked with military aviation history, specifically naval aviation. I've got quite fond memories of the pilots that used to fly from here, because when I was in the Royal Marines, they took me on training missions all over the southwest. And I'm heading to an airfield that played a vital role in the Second World War. The 1940s was the breakthrough era for naval aviation. By the end of the war, one vast type of ship was becoming the centerpiece of world naval powers, the aircraft carrier. Touching down on a carrier was inch critical. Get the approach wrong, and it could mean disaster. And even when down, pilots needed to hook an arresting cable to stop the aircraft fast. It was highly skilled flying. So they came here to Henstridge to practice their landings on this. A 440 foot section of discolored runway. The dummy deck. I've set myself my own little challenge. I am my Piper Cub. I'm going to try and land, see if I can put it on the dummy deck. Norfolk Yankee turning final 0 7. Norfolk Yankee wind from the north about 3 knots. Perfect, Echo Yankee. Rudder is alive. There might be just a 4 mile an hour crosswind, but I have to be bang on with my touchdown. And remember, at sea, this strip would be constantly shifting. First things first, don't land short. I landed short. But let's see if I can stop before the other end. Uh oh. Ah, that's me in the drink twice. But in my defence, my cub ideally needs 900 feet to stop on hard surfaces and I didn't get to use an arresting hook. That's my excuse, anyway. Runways aside, it's difficult to spot any military connections at Henstridge these days. 
It's a busy place full of light aircraft like mine. But there's also somebody here who's up to something quite out of the ordinary. What I'm about to see here at good old Henstridge is completely unlike anything I've ever seen before. Local man Richard Browning used to be a city trader until he set out on a mission to prove that one man's body, his own, could work seamlessly with the power of the jet engine. It sounds mad, strapping rockets to your arms. Jet engines, not jet as bad as rockets. Yeah, oh. you can turn them off. Rockets, you can't turn off. This is more controlled and thought through and scientific. Yeah, yeah. We thought, well, we need something that's going to generate some, some pretty awesome power versus its weight, and jet engines are about as best you can get. Can I pick this up? You certainly can. Richard started experimenting with these miniature jet engines bolted into handheld mounts. This is the original sort of Mark I mount. You can try if you like. That was where we mounted the very first engine and it allowed you to just kind of fire it up and point it around. Over several months, Richard tried out different setups with mixed results. But over time, he began to tame all this raw jet power. I could get rid of the wheelchair. I could just go from my living Absolutely. room to the kitchen with this Absolutely. kit on. You might destroy the living room and the kitchen, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it would be a fun way of getting think, there. I yes. think so, I think so. After 12 months of training, it's time to test the latest prototype. All that remains is to power it up and let it loose on Henstridge's tarmac. Pushing the red trigger switch by his fingers fires up the engines. It takes around 90 seconds for them to get up to speed. Once they're there, Richard uses his arms to direct nearly 300 pounds of thrust downwards, more than enough to get the better of gravity. Months of gym work have given Richard the strength to control six jet engines, which between them guzzle a gallon of fuel every minute. That is awesome. <laughs> it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. full on works. You kind of think it's a bit mad, but it works. Were you at full power there? No, I'm probably 75, 70% power. If I gave it full power and brought my arms in, I'd be where the clouds are in a moment. What's stopping him is what Richard calls the death zone. He thinks he'd need to reach at least 500 feet before a parachute could be any use at all. Engine failure at a lower altitude could be disastrous. Nevertheless, Richard believes the military and search and rescue are already showing an interest. So, who knows? Soon, this wingless form of flight may be taking to the skies somewhere near you. Clear prop! Time for me to revert to more established modes of flight. I'm heading north and into Gloucestershire in search of a man who's turned his passion for flying into a remarkable line of work. Beneath me is the beautiful Cotswold town of Stroud. And just over there is Nymphsfield. Now it's an airfield that normally only gliders operate from, but they do accept power in aeroplanes every now and then. Nymphsfield is as beautiful as its name suggests. It's more like landing on a wild flower meadow than an airstrip. Off to one side is a small green hangar which contains an astonishing labour of love. Rupert Wasey spent three years constructing this beautiful 1920s inspired Stark and Flitzer biplane. But when it came to the propeller, he simply couldn't find anything that met his expectations. So he built one himself. 
I came to realize that a propeller needs to be designed specifically for the aircraft as a, a bespoke item. So the propeller needs to be as unique as the aeroplane. Yeah, it's a stunning thing though, isn't it? How many attempts did it take you before you got a propeller that you were happy with? Interestingly, the very first one we made mm -hmm. and put on performed much, much better than the original. So we realized that we're onto something. During the early part of the 20th century, making wooden propellers was highly skilled work. Everything was hand cut and shaped with hours of patient trimming to create the perfect curve. Since jet engines took over, those skills have largely been lost. But at Rupert's workshop on the edge of Stroud, the wooden propeller is back. 21st century design software now talks directly to an automated cutting machine. Absolutely mesmerizing. We've made nearly 600 propellers now, and I just still just love watching it. You've got to love the way that the propeller almost like because it takes it off in layers. Yeah. The propeller sort of grows out it's, of this block. It's of like wood. rising out, isn't it? Yeah. It takes the cutter around five hours to carve the propeller from the block of beech wood. It's amazing to think that in the 1920s and 1930s, this was all done by hand men who had pure skill just using hand tools to create these incredibly precise instruments. But now we've got amazing pieces of equipment like this to be able to cut it perfectly. Rupert may have technology on his side, but his guidance comes from a library of old propeller manuals he's collected over the years. This has been a fantastic book. This is Rotol Propellers. I knew we really needed this book. It's got very important information. So I was willing to pay £500 for it. Um, I got it for £3.50 plus £1.50 postage. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no doubting what Rupert's greatest find has been. This is the holy grail of propeller drawings. Spitfire Mark, Mark VII. Mark seven. This is an original. This is the absolute original pen and ink drawing. Rupert discovered this priceless drawing by chance when a nearby office was being done up. Lying hidden for over 60 years, the plan contains all the information needed to address a little known issue with the most British of all aeroplanes. At the moment, there's many Spitfires flying, there's lots of restorations flying around, but all of them have got German propellers on the front. Um, Whoa, whoa, whoa. So yeah. let me just stop you right there, Rupert. What did you just say? <laughs> There's an irony, I know. <laughs> oh, that's Spitfires more... have German propellers right. at the moment. For decades now, if your Spitfire has needed a propeller, the place to go has been Munich. I feel like Churchill sitting down at the board saying, "This is wrong. We've got to do." It's my about duty this. to set this right. I know. But using his original drawings, Rupert will soon be making British propellers for the ultimate British aeroplane. They're likely to cost tens of thousands of pounds. Heritage comes at a price. Back in the workshop, the prop is off the cutting machine. I could quite happily come here and make propellers all day, every day. All that remains is a spray and finish, and Rupert has one he made earlier. We spend weeks and weeks making this perfect, beautiful thing, and then we've got to give it away to someone. Yeah, I can understand why you don't want to give them away. It's a really beautiful thing. They're nice things, aren't they? Can I feel it? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's incredibly light. That would take pride of place above any fireplace, exactly. wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, indeed. But we've got to stick it on an aeroplane yeah. and do loads of crazy cool stuff. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Rupert's wooden propellers now sell across the world. Powering a whole new generation of aviators into the air. Oh, I love this area. I'm on a flying adventure in my part of the world. These are the skies I know and love the best. The sea, Cotswold Stone, and all the beautiful little houses and buildings. Yeah, I just love all that. But this natural beauty spot is full of surprises. I'm making a very short hop across Gloucestershire 
to the biggest airfield in the area. So we're approaching Cotswold Airport now. For most of its 80 year existence, Cotswold Airport was known as RAF Kemble, one of the key military airfields in the area and one time home to the Red Arrows. Today it's privately owned and thriving. Look at the size of the place. You've got all the massive airliners, the big hangars, huge runways. See a 747 on the nose. Me and my little Piper Cub brushing shoulders with the big boys. <laughs> One of my favourite sayings in aviation is that any landing you can walk away from is a good one. And when people say that to me, bearing in mind I'm in a wheelchair, I always say, well, I haven't had a good one yet. <laughs> I love this place. It's a hotbed of aviation industries and activity. But nothing in aviation comes cheap. So when running an airport, money, bright ideas, and nerves of steel all help. <laughs> this is Susanna Harvey, international polo player and airport boss. She lives life in the fast lane as we accelerate past 85 miles an hour. Wow, that's about as fast as my cub flies. <laughs> and we haven't finished yet. That's about a Spitfire speed, that's 20. That's about the speed of 747 takes off. Susanna's family have owned the Kemble site since 2001. I don't think I've ever been in a car as fast as this. <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? Yeah. That's one of the benefits of having your own airport, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool line. We've parked up at the boundary of the airport, and no, we're not checking in for a flight. This Boeing 747 may look like it's ready to be boarded, but passengers may get a bit of a shock as they come through the door. No, this isn't the next thing in budget flying, but Cotswold Airport's hottest night spot. So, this is our 747 party plane. It's bonkers, isn't it, really? <laughs> I can't believe how big it is. No, uh, it's certainly a vast space and it's so versatile, you can do so much with it. Built in 1979, this 747 is a long way from its days carrying cargo in Ghana. Today, it hosts everything from product launches to weddings. As far as I'm aware, it's the only one in Europe, so... I've been around planes for a long time and I don't think I've ever been on a party plane yeah. quite like this. This was the old cargo loading door here. Yeah, sure. So we put a panoramic window in there. It looks brilliant. I bet you've had some pretty ruckus parties in here. Yeah, from what I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> but they're always the best ones. They're always yeah. the best ones. But Susanna's 747 is not the only husk of an aircraft that's been reborn at Cotswold Airport. On the other side of the runway, Planes that have reached their use-by date are also finding life after death. I'm meeting the undertaker of the aviation world, Mark Gregory. He's created one of the UK's leading aircraft salvage companies after an airline made him redundant in 1995. With my redundancy money, I then went ahead and bought uh, a small aircraft. It was a HS-748. Yeah. which I then broke for spare parts yeah, and honest. sold the parts on to an airline. It took me about six months to dismantle it and then cut it up. I actually cut the flight deck off and put the flight deck in my garden. So I was known to the residents and the locals as a bit, bit crazy. And when he sold the doors for £4,000 each, he knew he was onto something. His back garden project relocated to Cotswold Airport and is now the final destination for hundreds of aircraft. Many of them are Boeing 747s, the mighty jumbo jet. A retired jumbo is worth around $4 million, but stripped down, its individual parts can be worth a lot more. The engine's worth 
between 1.5 and $2 million just for this engine, which was removed some time ago. It's gone back into the supply chain again and been reused again. Considering you've got four engines on this aircraft. It's a good payday when you get rid of it them. It is indeed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mark charges a flat rate to strip a 747 bear, and his team can do it in around 10 to 15 weeks. 170 miles of electrical cabling, 18 four-foot high wheels, and over 360 lights, gauges, and switches on the flight deck are just some of the six million individual components. And then there's the carry-on items. We find all sorts of things from coins to credit cards to wallets. And the most unusual thing we found was some cocaine which was stowed in uh, one of the rear toilets. Blimey. There was only four packages wrapped in bin liners and gaffer tape around it. Really? The value, so I was told, was about $4 million, which was actually more than the value of the aircraft. Quite a day, I imagine, for the Gloucestershire police. As a lover of planes, I find it quite sad to see these once magnificent machines slowly being taken to pieces. But all aeroplanes have a limited life. The stresses of flying degrades their airframes and it eventually becomes more expensive to repair than scrap. But some aircraft are worth preserving, no matter what the costs. At the far end of Cotswold Airport is something very special. The English Electric Canberra. The RAF's first jet-powered bomber. When it came into service in 1951, it outpaced and flew far higher than any of its rivals. This plane is the last flying example of the PR9 model. And the man who flew it is squadron leader Dave Piper. What do you think of our beautiful PR9? It's unbelievable, hey, isn't it? What a great aeroplane. It's stunning, absolutely yeah. stunning. I've done many a long hour transiting in various parts of the world in this, sitting there with the autopilot engaged. By 1957, the Canberra had smashed the world altitude record, flying well into the stratosphere at 70,000 feet. And with the Cold War raging, the Canberra's role switched from bomber to spy plane. In the 1980s, they flew top secret missions over the Middle East and Afghanistan. But he wasn't exactly alone. So, there we are. The nose cone was built for a spy, preferably a small one. Yeah, that is right. unbelievable. I've never seen an aeroplane that's nose pops off uh, to allow crew access. Yeah, because you can see in the back there now, that's where no he lived. No way. Yeah. That it's is the most claustrophobic space I think I've ever seen. And I've seen inside yeah. submarines and things. And that's yeah. unbelievable. This spy would have an arsenal of high resolution cameras at his fingertips. And in a world before surveillance drones and Google Earth, some unbelievable images could be captured by the camera. Like this one, taken from 40,000 feet in the early 90s, of Baghdad during the first Gulf War. That's from a camera. That's from the camera, from the, potentially this aeroplane. There weren't, really? There weren't that many left at, towards the end. This one, I think, I'll have a little quiz. Oh, yeah. Now, you recognise where we're looking at here. Yeah. OK. Can you see what the time was by looking Gosh. at it carefully? Yeah, you can. What, yeah. quarter to one? Yeah, so whereabouts do you think that was taken from? What distance? Well, looking at it, you'd think it was a helicopter flying over the Thames, probably. Yeah. OK. That was taken from the Isle of Wight. What? Oh. How on yeah. earth did you manage that? That's scary, Is that isn't incredible? it? incredible? It's going to make me start wearing clothes around a bedroom <laughs> with a window with a curtain <laughs> open. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't yeah. it? Oh, yeah. Absolutely and that's, that's the capability this aeroplane had, and that we had. Blimey. Yeah. The Canberra and its stories are like something out of a James Bond movie. A glimpse into a secret world, and a reminder that aviation has an impact on all of our lives, even if we don't know it.
From my vantage point, a thousand feet above the Cotswolds, this stunning landscape reveals a story. One that was repeated across much of the country. When you take off like me with a real interest in aviation, you can't help but notice all of these little Second World War airfields dotted around the place. Below me right now is an overgrown triangle of old runways, RAF Down Amney. After the war, the majority of these airfields were no longer needed and they were quickly wound down. But just two miles east is one of the exceptions. If you have a look, you'll be able to see RAF Fairford on the note. Fairford is a juggernaut of an airbase. It started life just like Down Amney, but it couldn't be more different now. During the 1950s, the Ministry of Defence decided to turn it into a massive Cold War nuclear bomber base. Today, Fairford and its 10,000-foot runway serve as a standby airfield for the US Air Force. In its time, it's hosted Concorde, the Space Shuttle, and even Barack Obama. But the military history of this part of the country gets even more remarkable. I'm flying around 40 miles south into Wiltshire and over one of the most famous military training grounds in the country. This is Salisbury Plain. Wilderness, really. It's a very barren countryside. What's really cool is that I can see these big plumes of dust and it's just massive tanks chundling along. I'm in search of an airfield that dates back to the very dawn of military aviation. At the heart of this restricted military zone, it's a secretive place. And I'm not allowed to land there. Yeah, Golf Yankee, you're turning final for 2 5. Okay, Yankee, right hand circuit, please. Oh, Roger. So I'm touching down at nearby Thruxton Airport. Nailed that sucker. A short drive gets me to my destination. One of the oldest continually running airfields in the world. The military base of Netheraven. Seeing that Chinook there actually brings back some really, really fond memories. I remember from my time in the Marines, jumping out the back of those things on fast ropes, but also using them to get from A to B on training exercises all the time. Never even has trained all the armed forces, but just over a century ago, its creation was a landmark moment in military history. The British Army could see a great change on the horizon. So on the site of an existing cavalry school, they turned their attention to a radical new form of warfare, using planes. Historian Susan Lindsay is taking me back to a watershed moment. That is incredible. That's a photograph of old meeting new, isn't it? You've got these cavalry officers with these great plumes and swords of a biplane flying over the top. It's just a change in the times. Complete change in the times. There's quite a lot of opposition when new ideas come along. So when they first started using aeroplanes for army manoeuvres, there were complaints that it was considered unsportsmanly to have somebody sitting up in the sky looking at what troops were doing. And there were also complaints that they scared the horses and things like that. Nevertheless, the army established a new arm, the Royal Flying Corps. And as the Great War loomed in 1914, the brightest and the best were summoned to Netheraven for an intensive training camp. Around 60 aircraft and 700 men prepared for war. So say I was a pilot based here in 1914 at the mm -hmm. camp, what sort of training would I expect to receive? 
the main focus was reconnaissance, but they also did things like tactical exercises, they did training, they did tests and experiments, they looked at aerial photography, and it was a really good opportunity for all these different elements of the Royal Flying Corps to come together and actually discuss about how they thought it would be a good way to operate. With the outbreak of war, military aviation was scaled up. Pilots from across the country were given just two weeks training and packed off to the Western Front in France, where the fighting was brutal. Once there, pilot life expectancy was just 11 days. And over the four years of the war, more than 14,000 British pilots lost their lives. But the aviation breakthroughs made at Neverhaven helped secure victory in 1918. And that year saw the formation of a new and separate armed service, the Royal Air Force. It's the stories of the early pioneers from like Neverhaven, who in the early 1900s flew in the build up to the First World War. They first got me fascinated about flying and wanting to be a pilot. It still amazes me what has gone on in odd rural spots like here in Wiltshire. I've found some fantastic aeroplanes, seen some bizarre and interesting places, and I've also met people that have inspired me to just continue flying and do what it is I love. Next time, I'm in the southeast, tackling some of the world's busiest airspace. A mistake here will get you into a lot of trouble. I'll visit the home of an aerial monster. You land it on water? Yeah, absolutely. I'll find ghosts of London's wartime past. It looks like something out of Star Wars. And there's one massive tip for my bucket list. You are the only person prime this bit,